Okay, now I, I do recognize that I have talked about um, romantic poetry um, for way too long already. So I will um, keep my discussion of the last of the, the big six of romantic poetry, John Keats, um, as brief as possible. Um, also because um, Keats is in many ways maybe the quintessential romantic poet, um, but that is something that is, is experienced um, best out of reading his poems. Um, it's not so much, he's not such a programmatic poet uh, in the way that we can classify others um, like Wordsworth who, um, who had sort of very straight um, um, programmatic notions or, or, uh, or the others. So uh, he's not as revolutionary as, as Shelley. Um, he's certainly not as famous as Byron in his own time. Uh, in fact, he was only known and appreciated um, by a relatively small circle of uh, of admirers in his in his own time he wasn't quite as obscure as um, as Blake um, but it really um, only it really took the 19th century um, the Victorian age to to discover him as the most accomplished poet in in the English um, literature and um, so as I said he's probably the most romantic um, but he's also probably the most poetic so really um, the, the, the best thing that I can say is um, read Keats um, read him with an ear to the sound with an ear to the beauty of the language uh, go to the reading list um, and, and basically read everything that we have uh, put on there um, he's also romantic in, in, in the way, uh, in the tragic way that, that um, many of these poets had that they um, died relatively young. Um, so did Keats. Um, so he didn't really have time to produce a very substantial oeuvre. Um, nevertheless, he's, he, he created a, a, quite a, a great deal in his, in his life. And one thing we can see when we look at the development of his poetry from his earliest age and from his earliest writing um, to the more mature writing um, shortly before his death is, is that we can see how intensely um, he worked on perfecting um, his, his writing and perfecting his, his poetry. He was, um, he was supremely uh, obsessed with poetic form, with poetic language, and with um, coming up with the most uh, poetic um, way to, to express things. So that, that, that's one of the reasons why I, I say um, you really should, should try to experience that in, in reading his texts um, themselves. Out of the texts that um, that there are, um, the ones that I want to mention um, because they are usually the the most often anthologized of his works, uh, and you will find them on on any kind of reading list, in any kind of anthology, in any kind of of, of handbook. Um, those are the the, the so-called great odes, um, all of them written in 1819, and you see them here. I see the list of them here. I also highlighted. Um, a few that are even amongst those very very central texts uh, are considered to be more central and that you will um, find again and again in, in teaching and in, in, in courses and everything so really you should you, you should um, check these these out uh, um, these um, are exemplary romantic um, poems taking up uh, a form the ode that was a, a classical form uh, but that here is is reshaped in characteristic um, romantic way. It was an irregular form um, in contrast to the sonnet, for example, which was always had always been a very straight um, um, formal framework, which could then be worked on, as we saw, for example, in, in, in Shelley's case. The ode was much more irregular, which was much more open. And this is what, what Keats does. He uses them to create these um, longish short poems, if you will. Um, they're longer than a sonnet, then, but they're not epic in, in any length. Uh, but they give him the room to develop um, an idea, to develop uh, a theme and, uh, and, uh, and thoughts. The, um, this is sort of, this is it, this is a sort of ground zero of, of romantic poetry, uh, Keats's Ode to a Nightingale, um, where, and I, I, I sketched the situation uh, earlier when I talked about, uh, in general, about romantic poetry, how Keats 
here takes the situation of sitting in um, um, in, in, in the evening, sitting in the garden and listening to the nightingale, which you can't hear. This is one of those symbols of um, an inspiration that comes from nature, but that is inscrutable, that is difficult to, to understand. And this is what the poem does. Really, the poem isn't, isn't so much an argument, a ready-made argument that is finished, but it's rather um, the performance of thoughts, the performance of sort of a meditation um, of the uh, the associative um, thoughts that 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 come to the poet's mind. Um, this is why it's it's stressing this moment in time when he's sitting there, and this is why you have something like the image there that someone actually creates an image of the the moment that this is supposed to depict. Now, obviously, this has been worked on um, quite a lot, um, but it tries to recreate that that kind of spontaneousness and that kind of in the moment that this this being in the moment so just that you get a, a at least um uh, the sound a little bit this is the opening um here of the poem um, where the poet uh, already or the speaker already sort of describes his own melancholy situation his own uh, mood which is sort of a brooding darker mood my heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains my sense as though of hemlock i had drunk or emptied some dull opiate to the drains, one minute passed and leafy wards had sunk. So this is also sort of kind of a, a receptive mood. It's a melancholic mood, but it's a mood that is receptive to um, to these, uh, to whatever the, 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 the song of the bird might, might teach him. And some of those are dark thoughts, actually. So characteristically, um, the, um, the, the speaker also meditates about death um, here. Um, Darkling, I listen. And for many a time, I have been half in love with easeful death. Called him soft names and many a mused rhyme to take into the air my quiet breath. Now, more than ever, seems it rich to die, to seize upon the midnight with no pain, while thou art pouring forth thy soul abroad in such an ecstasy. But he goes on to to reject that thought as well and and um, to say no that, that 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 would also be stupid so we see that this is really um a, a train of thought where that we are experiencing along with him and it, that goes along with this inspiration of of the bird and it's really a great poem so just go on and read keats and then i don't have to talk about him anymore and you can spend that time by uh, reading so we, we have talked poetry a lot um, in, in, in the context of Romanticism. Um, we haven't talked about um, the novel, um, about prose writing. Um, there was one novel that, that I've mentioned um, several times that um, obviously falls into, into Romanticism, and that is uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Um, but the one novelist that is um, central to this time, although she is often not um, not automatically regarded as a romantic writer is is Jane Austen. Now, obviously, um, her uh, she falls into that that period, as you can see from um, from the dates of her life. Um, and a text like uh, Pride and Prejudice was published in 1813, so square in the middle of um, the later Romantic um, period. Um, but she is um, also, of course, in many respects, uh, an anon anomaly. Uh, anomaly. That's a difficult word. Um, so um, one thing that makes her special is that from out of those writers that are regarded as classics, um, she is one of the few that is still widely read. In fact, the, is the, she is the only novelist before Charles Dickens who still has a significant popular readership. And her fictional world, um, seen as an idyllic bygone time and place, unlike and maybe even preferable to the present, has entered into popular literary culture, uh, into contemporary popular literary culture. So she is she's still a present uh, presence on the literary um, scene today, even though um, her writing is uh, is already 200 years old. So as I said, she wasn't considered to be, um, for most most of the time, to be a romantic writer. And that had a lot to do um, with her politics, or rather sort of the lack of, of concrete politics that we, we see in her, her novels. Um, 
Jane Austen writes about a social world um, where individual desires are regulated by elaborate codes and manners and decorum. And the Romantic movement had um, had also talked about that, that society, um, but had allied itself usually with revolutionary politics, the overthrow of monarchs, the resistance to authority and to hierarchy of all kinds, including for women, um, the overthrow of patriarchal authority, whereas Austen is often considered either apolitical or rather conservative in her views, since her novels are not directly concerned with the great revolutionary upheavals of the day, and they do not appear to challenge traditional institutions or conventions. Um, although writing before the reign of Queen Victoria, Austen's felt period for many of her readers is the Victorian. Very often um, students do make that mistake of, of sort of grouping her with uh, the Victorians, although in fact her literary inspirations were late 18th century writers uh, like Francis Burney. Um, on the other hand, her concentration on character and on personality and on the tensions between her heroines and their society makes her work more closely related to the modern world than to the tradition of the 18th century. And her narrative technique actually points forward to modern literature. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit difficult to, to, um, to classify her in that sense. And this is one of the things that, that uh, makes her uh, enduringly interesting. Now, the popular uh, reading strategy of Austen sees her as either, either voicing timeless concerns of human relationship or the depiction of a domestic life as remote from the social and political issues of her time. But at the time that Austen was writing, questions of domesticity, um, of sort of the, 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 the familiar um, social circle, of class and gender roles, were indeed regarded as inherently political. I have tried to show one of the ways how sort of the domestic can become political um, in, in the sentimental. Um, thus, already in her first major novel, uh, Northanger Abbey, um, this is not only a parody of a particular mode, uh, the Gothic, but is also concerned with the politics that are implied in that mode. Now, you remember that um, in the end of the 18th century, there is this, this, this fashion, this craze for writing Gothic novels. And you also remember um, these two people, hopefully, um, two of the most radical thinkers of that time, William Godwin, philosopher, Mary Wollstonecraft, um, arguably the first feminist. And both of them um, used the Gothic mode. They basically wrote novels that appear to be Gothic novels, um, but in which it, it turns out that basically um, the Gothic, the Gothic villain, um, the Gothic kind of suppression is really just uh, uh, a, a symbol for um, political tyranny, um, for political reality, um, for patriarchal suppression. Um, so William Godwin's um, Caleb Williams and, and, and Mary Wollstonecraft's Mary or, or the Wrongs of Women, um, there we have sort of these similar structures of um, of mystery and 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 some kind of of persecution, but it turns out that this is really about um, the politics and that this is sort of a revolutionary indictment of things as they are. And that's kind of the framework against which Austen writes her first novel, um, Northanger Abbey. Because Austen rejects this, this English Jacobin uh, political Gothicism, um, and she shows that uh, by, by, um, by sort of having her, her main character fall into the trap of reading her surroundings as as Gothic. So in the unfamiliar setting of Northanger Abbey, Catherine, the main character, does make a mistake in interpretation. Um, lacking any worldly experience, she relies on what she has learned in reading novels. And she reads uh, her present novel, uh, her present world, as if it were that of a Gothic romance. And she sees um, General Tilney, one of the characters, as a domestic tyrant, and Northanger as a facade for secret horrors. Now, Henry Tilney, um, the son um, recognizes her error, and he reminds her of the present social and political reality. And this is from the novel, when, when he says to her, well, remember the country and the age in which we live. Remember that we are English, that we are Christians. Consult your own understanding, your own sense of the probable, your own observation of what is passing around you. 
Does our education prepare us for such atrocities as she has imagined? Do our laws connive them? Could they be perpetrated without being known in a country like this, where social and literary intercourse is on such a footing, where every man is surrounded by a neighborhood of voluntary spies, and where roads and newspapers lay everything open? So in a way, uh, the, the, the major, main character has kind of fallen into the trap of, uh, trap of, of, of conspiracy theories and to believe um, the, 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 the fiction over the reality. And he says, no, no, think that this isn't, this isn't the country we're living in. We're not living in, in a Gothic novel in which highly improbable events can happen. Um, this is reality and, and things here happen because um, they are probable to, to happen. And yet, and that is the interesting thing, it's not uh, as if she's totally wrong. Now she is not in a gothic novel, and um, and Tilney isn't isn't a a, a gothic villain. Um, he isn't a monster, but he's also a bad person. Um, so Henry actually has to discover that her imagining uh, imaginings about her father have some truth. Uh, if he's not a gothic tyrant, generally Tilney is. Um, the, a modern equivalent, um, an ambitious choir aiming to advance his position by courtly intrigue and the manipulation of the marriage market. So what Austin does is that she retains what we might call a reformist criticism of courtliness and emulation as social, as real social evil. So she really says, okay, this isn't, a, this is a wrong behavior and that, that, that needs to change, um, while at the same time rejecting um, reformist global condemnation of things as they are. Things as they are was the, the subtitle of, of um, um, William Godwin's Caleb Williams. So um, this isn't revolutionary, but it also doesn't, it doesn't say that everything is fine, everything is good. Um, so um, it, it, it has that, that ambiguity built in. Um, and this double move is characteristic of post-revolutionary literature. Um, and the move is finalized, formalized in the novel's plot uh, by Catherine's disillusionment with um, the family of the Thorpes and the dismay at the general's inhumanity, and also by Henry Tilney's confrontation with his father and his decision to choose Catherine as a wife. So it's not the, um, the point that I want to make is that Austen isn't apolitical or, or conservative, but that she rejects the revolutionary uh, radicalism um, of of uh, many of the romantics and and sort of finds her own way. Uh, we can see this ob obviously also played out even in the title of um, her novel *Sense and Sensibility*, published in 1811. Um, sensibility. Um, this is part of sort of the sentimentalism discourse, of course. Um, is seen as an indulgence of personal absolutes such as romantic love, regardless of social conventions and even laws. And this was widely seen as a major ideological source of revolutionary transgressions. To, to sort of completely give in to sensibility was um, kind of a first step towards um, a revolutionary um, excess. And the revolution debate sense um, or common sense, this is in the, in the, in the um, way of common sense, was often opposed to revolutionary theory, speculation and enthusiasm. And furthermore, Sense and Sensibility clearly establishes the value of feminine passive virtues of the kind possessed from the outset by the character of Eleanor and acquired through error and suffering by the character Marianne. These virtues were proclaimed by numerous writers of the revolutionary aftermath. At the same time, it is clear that Sense and Sensibility registers the desperate situation of genteel women deprived of their wherewithal to sustain social dignity or even nobility of mind and feeling. So again, uh, it's not like everything is good. Um, it's that we need to balance um, the sensibility with uh, the sense. So if Austin was a feminist, uh, it's one of the, the, the major points of debate. Is she, is she a feminist? Is she an early feminist? Is she uh, too conservative for that? And if she was a feminist, she was, certainly was a post-revolutionary one. Um, in Austin's um, novelistic universe reform on the individual level is enough to affect social change. So she's certainly not out to change the stru structures of society, but rather um, her point of entry is the individual. And she said you need to change the individual, and those changes 
will then change society. And, and this, is, this is sort of uh, her vision of, of reform. Another highly interesting aspect of, of Austen's writing is, of course, um, her narrative technique, um, the way that she narrates these novels. And this has a lot to do with why these novels are still appealing to readers, but it also shows her as a very important um, point in the development of, of narrative in general. In, in many ways, Austen is, is sort of at, um, at a crossroad in terms of, of the development of narrative. What we can see already in, in Northanger Abbey is, is a move away from um, romantic and sentimental idealization um, towards an uncovering of reality. So we might think that she is adhering to this realist uh, framework that, that was developed by writers like, like um, um, Daniel Defoe. But at the same time, this uncovering of reality isn't something that is unproblematic, um, but rather it becomes a problem of narrative mediation it becomes a problem of how to how how do we uncover um reality and and, and how far are we and our subjectivity um involved in that and in, in this way we can see her as truly a part of the romantic uh, movement in that that subjectivity becomes an important aspect here because the reality of things isn't something that is easily perceived and, re uh, and, and recognized it's something that is recognized by individuals and by 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 subjects um, who have their own biases, who have their own prejudices. So characters are a bias, prejudice. They need to negotiate between the claims of a rational sense and um, the voice of individual sensibility. They need to understand themselves and the people around them. And um, and the question is, then now this this is something that happens on. On the, uh, the level of characters, as we see, um, but the interesting question is, what is the role of the narrator in all of this? Um, where does the narrator stand there? How can the the author and the narrator, as sort of the spokesperson of the author, claim to represent reality, to have authority over the truth? And if you remember, um, basically Defoe came out with this idea that we just have to be neutral and, and objective and, and and base our our narrative on. Uh, on a on a on a very sort of objective scientific description of reality, and uh, Fielding came out and says, well, um, the narrator is basically um, the the, the stand-in for God who knows the truth and therefore is able to provide the truth. Um, Austin um, takes neither of these pl uh, positions or or a little bit of both in in a way. Um, so what Austin does is she she has. Um, Octoria narrators, she has um, omniscient narrators who, who, who can look into characters' minds, uh, who know the future, um, but she, um, she, con uh, she consciously restricts her, her knowledge um, and, and the narrator um, starts to assume at least partly her character's perspective. So to bring herself down to the perspective of individual characters. Um, and as this, she shows herself as a forerunner in a way of modernism. Um, so an important formal innovation and formal feature uh, of her um, uh, writing is um, free indirect discourse, a narrative technique um, that is crucial to, uh, um, um, for this uh, inward turn of, of the novel. In free indirect discourse, a text dominant narrative style, typically a third person, person um, and past tense uh, incorporates for, for only brief snatches um, or sometimes longer passages words that are emanating from a particular character, but without such tags as he said or she thought to make their attribution explicit. So linguistically, character and narrator momently merge and move apart again. Um, and um, I will show you this. Uh, um, so this is from Pride and Prejudice, where Elizabeth tells Darcy of um, Lydia's elopement, um, so the elopement of her sister with uh, Wickham, and she notices um, his distracted air as, she, as he paces the room. And then it says, Elizabeth soon observed and instantly understood it. Her power was sinking. Everything must sink under such a proof of family weakness. So these are the words of the narrator, um, clearly. There is no Elizabeth's 
thought, um, there are no quotation marks, no direct. Um, uh, but the question is, who says must? For whom is this a necessary fact? Everything must sink under such a proof of family weakness. It might seem that this is the narrator saying this, uh, but it's not. It's actually what Elizabeth observes and what how she interprets the situation. And the interesting thing is that uh, she's wrong. Um, she she misreads the scene. She misreads the, the situation, and we learn that later. Um, but but only later then can we find out. Okay, so this wasn't actually an authoritative pronouncement by the narrator, but it actually was something that um, that this character thought. Um, and this is sort of the trick how um, Austin brings us close to the character without making it very explicit. Um, but that kind of takes takes away um, some of the authority of the um, the, the, the narrator who isn't uh, sort of the Fielding-esque um, um, godlike narrator who is able to pronounce truth. Uh, take, for example, what is arguably the, the, the most often quoted first sentence in English literature, um, the first sentence of Pride and Prejudice. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. There is the must again, and it it actually starts with the truth, right? This is a truth. This is true. Um, but then, if we look closely, it says it is a truth universally acknowledged. So that actually just says that this is a truth that everyone agrees is true. It doesn't say anything about whether that actually is true. And that and this this is why this first sentence so so perfectly captured captures this um, the, the the position that the narrators in, in in Jane Austen take in that they seem to provide us with authoritative comments um, only to once we look closer to to show that well this is just something that that people think um, and and we need to position ourselves a, a, a amongst that this is the thing in a, with a narrator um, of feelings like you you either like the narrator and you and you agree and then you like the text in a way or you don't and then text kind of throws you off because it says no you you have to agree to my point of view um, and with austin this is always performative this is always something we do in the course of writing this is something we need to agree on and this is why um, we feel as we read these texts that um, we participate in a way that we we, we can't in, in in other earlier forms of, of narrative writing and one thing we can note is that that um, in in the course of Austin's writing, um, free and direct um, discourse becomes progressively more present in the in the novel. It becomes ever more important. So it's actually something that she builds on, and not just something that she 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 did once. Um, and this is part of, as I said, this is part of what what makes reading her novel so so rewarding and so interesting. Um, and um, where where Austin really, in a way, manipulates um, the reader and makes the reading process as as part of what what the novels are about in a way. Um, Austin's novels build on sentimentalism's concept of empathy. In a way, um, this uh, you know our, our our ability to feel what someone else feels, but um, she goes beyond the binary of feeling and unfeeling. Well, we had that in in these these highly sentimental novels that says you either feel it or you don't and and it's all about feelings and feeling is 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 completely opposed to to knowledge um now austin includes knowledge in 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 this um uh, because these these things aren't aren't distinct um we're not either feeling or we're knowing but rather what we know influences our feelings and our feelings actually influence what we know uh, and how we know that. Um, and therefore, um, she draws not only on, on empathy as, as the ability to feel for others, she actually also draws on what, what nowadays we, we are calling theory of mind, the human ability to guess what another person is thinking. And characteristically, her novels are full of very complex uh, and dynamic interrelations um, between characters that are driven by what one person thinks about another. I mean, this is, after all, one of the things that people love about, about Austin, all these different characters and their interrelation. Um, and I mean, 
just look at the, uh, the, 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 the characters in, in Pride and Prejudice and, and, and all of the different relations that, that they have. It tells you that this is, a, this is important and this actually also changes over time. And we are made to, to participate in these, in these changes and the way how these characters observe each other, observe each other thinking, think about what these other people are, are thinking and so on. Now look at this passage here from from Persuasion, um, which nicely illustrates this these these, these sort of interrelations between um, the characters. Here we have uh, three characters, um, two uh, women and one man, um, observing each other in a way. Um, it did not surprise, but it grieved Anne to observe that Elizabeth would not know him. She saw that so they're, they're meeting here in a in a shop, I think. Uh, she saw that he saw Elizabeth that Elizabeth saw him, that there was complete internal recognition on each side. <coughs> Excuse me. She was convinced that he was ready to be acknowledged as an acquaintance, expecting it, and she had the pain of seeing her sister turn away with unalterable coldness. So what we have here is one character observing two other characters observing each other, and she thinks what one of the characters thinks that the other character thinks. So this this kind of, of um, um, engagement with um, each other's thoughts is something that 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 characterizes Austen's novels. And obviously, um, the characters make mistakes, as we already saw in, in the earlier example. Um, so we have here um, a narrator who, of course, technically knows everything, um, who is technically omniscient and could tell us, uh, but restricts that kind of knowledge and, act, and, and instead lets us participate in the mental processes of the characters and also lets us fall into the same traps of misreading. So when characters misread situations or other characters um, and we get no indication, this is a mistake, this is wrong, um, we make the same mistake. And when they learn their mistakes, we learn them along with them. And that's the great thing that, that our reading becomes um, sort of a, a performance of the mental activity uh, that that happens um, with the the other characters um, that is connected with the emotional um, activity um, which is uh, of course um, why why we when we identify with these characters we also identify with their mistakes and and with their learning experience and and we can go along with that so to conclude novels like pride and prejudice construct an exercise in reading for both the protagonist and the reader and manipulate narrative so as to make the reader conscious of the fallibility and precariousness of reading of any kind. And that in itself is again, a very romantic thing, I would think. And last but not least in this survey of romantic writers, we have Sir Walter Scott, who I will be talking uh, mainly here as um, a novel writer. Interestingly, Scott um, first came to prominence as a writer um, of poetry. He was um, he was really the most popular poet um, for quite a number of years, and he was um, very well respected. Um, and um, from from 1805 on, um, and um, he he turned away from poetry uh, as he himself said, probably only half jokingly. He turned away from poetry because of the superior talent and the superior success of um, of Byron. Uh, when Byron e erupted on the scene and and sort of um, stole um, uh, the stage um, from from Scott, Scott said, "Okay, I think he's the better poet, and I'm I'm going to try something else." And um, that that he did, and he started writing novels. Uh, interestingly, um, he published these novels um, all anonymously. Tells us a little bit about the, um, the, the the social prestige or the low social prestige of the novel at the time. So he had no problem signing his name to his poetry, uh, but the novel was a different different um, matter. But what he did is he um, he pioneered a new form of of novel writing, um, and that is the historical novel. In fact, Scott established the historical novel as a, a serious genre in, in literary history. Um, he wasn't, technically speaking, um, the first to write a historical novel. Uh, Maria Edgeworth's, uh, Ed, Edgeworth's Castle Recrand uh, of 1800 um, has claims to be um, the first historical novel in English. 
Um, but it was Scott's novel, um, Waverly, or to 60 years since, that uh, and, and the many successors um, to this book uh, written by Scott that, that formed um, the, the model for the historical novel and that, that really formed um, something that, that other writers could, could take up and, and, and um, develop further. Now, um, this uh, notion of the um, historical novel came, of course, at a, also at a specific um, historical point in time. It came at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, when Europeans started to um, see themselves as existing in a relationship of complex transformation with social and political events. Um, people experienced um, the reconstruction re re um, of political systems, uh, political alliances, uh, political structures all throughout Europe and, and uh, sort of had a new awareness of, of historical change in a, in, in a will. Now, earlier um, periods regarded um, history rather as sort of a colorful background for expressions of what was considered to be um, the unchanging nature of humankind. Um, for example, uh, in, in Shakespeare, um, it, it doesn't really matter whether we are in ancient Rome or whether we are in medieval Denmark, um, or whether we're in, in Venice, uh, or whether we're in, in contemporary England, or in a, in a very unspecified place. The, 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 what changes maybe is the costumes, but the human nature within, that's what it's all about, and that is not influenced uh, to a large degree by outside, by these, these historical um, forces. In contrast, um, and this is the change um, that I try to sketch, uh, people Saw, begun to begin to began to understand that um, that historical situation actually change um, change us. The literary historian uh, Georg Lukacs has described some of the characteristics of the historical novel that that come that emerges out of these these considerations. So, in in contrast to the static idea of humans in the Enlightenment, man is now seen as a product of historical change. We are who and what we are because of our circumstances. And that means um, that the historical change is really uh, becomes the real subject. This is what, what, what historical novels are about, about historical developments. And the historical developments aren't just sort of, uh, as I said, colorful background or, um, or a, a reason for something happening, but rather this is what the, the novel uh, explores. And therefore, one thing that is very important to these these historical novels is historical faithfulness. This is where this um, the the idea comes from. You, you actually do you need to do your research. You need to um, get out anachronisms, um, things that don't fit into the period, and 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 be as historically accurate as possible when describing characters, locations, and society. Um, but also, it means that the historical events are not described from the perspective of the great. This is the difference to, uh, to the history plays of, of, of Shakespeare, uh, which are always um, told from the perspective of um, basically the, the, the highest point in, in, in history, and that's the king. Um, this is why they're all um, titled after kings. But So instead of that, what we get here is what is sometimes called the middle hero. So not an underdog, not, not sort of lower class, that has that is basically unafflicted by historical circumstances, but someone who is who is part of uh, historical change, but not the driving force, not the one who makes the decisions, not the one who makes the the, the, the change, but someone who is uh, experiencing these changes as they go along. So uh, again, in comparison to um, the early modern history. Um, which were uh, about history being made. Um, they were about um, the situations, the moments in time in which history is made. What the historical novel is all about is history being experienced. Now, obviously, this is a narrative genre that is very good at providing exactly that, pr providing individual experience, but in this case, individual experience that is expressive of um, history in, in its development. And that made it possible to experience history uh, in a very um, new way. Um, as I said, um, 
Waverly starts this, uh, but but Scott is um, was very very uh, productive, um, writing dozens and dozens of of, of novels um, that that build on the success of of this. Um, here is just sort of um, one selection of these um, from Waverly um, through Old Mortality, Rob Roy, Ivanhoe, The Bride of Lammermore, and The Heart of Midlothian. Uh, many of these texts have been adapted um, first to opera, stage plays, later on to movies. Um, you might have seen versions of them. Um, so Scott, both through the uh, the themes that he developed that develops, but also through the the form of the historical novel, becomes a major influence in. Uh, in in, in um, English literary history, and also these these uh, books are of course still um, very good and interesting to read.